first test. Let's go, eh? Let's go, let's go. Ever since I was a kid, I've always loved steam machines. And not because they drove the industrial revolution, but because their design is as simple as it is complex and interesting at the same time. But how can all this be possible? Throughout this video, you're going to realize this is an idea I've always had in my head. Friends, welcome to a new video and look what I got here. This is a little two-stroke engine. The idea is to transform it into a steam engine. In fact, I had started to make a small prototype three years ago using a disassembled uh, two-stroke engine, which with a slight modification can be used with uh, air or steam. But I abandoned the idea since the performance was not just horrible, but I didn't have enough knowledge or in my head, the project didn't make sense in some way until a few months ago. After literally assembling the engine in my head and seeing that it was working well. As if it were a simulation, I started gathering all the pieces to achieve it. And here I had a great limitation since I didn't have the necessary tools to make all the pieces I needed. Essentially, I don't have or know how to use a lathe because I don't have one. So I had to do everything with recycled materials or pieces. Let's quickly review how a steam engine works, just the engine, without considering the boiler and other components. The most famous and efficient model is the one used, for example, by old steam locomotives. The double expansion engine, or also called compound, patented by James Watt, which consists of a piston inside a chamber and a valve which, when moved, allows steam to pass from one side or the other, also allowing the escape of the already used steam. While this is the most efficient option, I'm going to make a more simplified version, single space or uniflow, where steam only enters from one side, as my tools again prevent me from making the previous one. This project will consist of three main phases. The first where we are going to make the engine as such, the second where we are going to make the boiler that should withstand pressures up to 150 pounds and generate at least another 60 constantly. And the third, where we are going to make the steam car as such, mounting the boiler, the engine, and solving the engineering issue so that it works and moves. I started with the most basic piece, the piston and the expansion chamber. For this, I used two front motorcycle bars. Once we disassemble it, we will see that they enter with an almost perfect seal. They even generate good compression. Something a little better could be a motorcycle or car piston, but due to the shape, the bar seemed the most convenient to me. In the corner where I had the screw, I had to connect the air or steam inlet. First, I opted to weld a copper pipe there. I already had some experience welding aluminum with copper, and well, I wanted to try. The problem was that the alloy of the bar was horrible, and it broke before it could even be welded. My second idea was to glue it with epoxy, and it looked very good, but all products derived from epoxy melt with heat. And my third and best option was simply to make a hole of one quarter inch British standard pipe, pass a male through it and screw a bronze elbow from behind. And it turned out spectacular. I wanted to test the quality of compression I could generate. So I connected a solenoid valve and the compressor with a pressure of a hundred pounds per square inch. I activated it and Um, it was definitely too much power. It even came out with such force that it dented that back window. But, well, this was a good sign. As it said, it had a lot of strength, and that surely this was going to turn out well. Like every engine, the linear movement must be transformed into radial movement, so we need a crankshaft. In locomotives, the crankshaft is the wheel itself, but for this to work well, we need astronomical amounts of pressure. Keep in mind that a locomotive of that era operated with around 300 pounds per square inch. This figure is astronomical. It's about three times more than what today's compressors use. And clearly, I didn't do it with that pressure because I didn't have materials that could withstand that. We are going to work between 100 and 150 pounds per square inch or pounds per square inch. So I decided to use the method that steam tractors used, for example. These engines didn't directly drive the wheels, but they would spin a flywheel connected to the crankshaft. And then that wheel connected to the actual wheels through some kind of clutch or mechanism. 
A flywheel is like this battery here. They perform exactly the same function. But how can this be possible? In the case of the battery, we all know it. We charge the battery with a charge or energy or current, and then we use it based on what we need, whether it's to use the cell phone or remote control, whatever. The flywheel is exactly the same, only instead of charging it with electricity, it is simply charged by making it spin, or in other words, adding a force to it. The wheel will hold on to that energy, just like the battery would, and then we can take that energy from the wheel to spin something else. One stores electrical energy, the other kinetic energy. But in the end, both could be called batteries. Going back to the engine, before adding any flywheel, I had to make it spin. For this, I disassembled an old motorcycle engine that was all broken, except for the crankshaft and the connecting rod which I needed. The crankshaft had to face the forks, and to be able to mount everything I built a base using in 50 profile that I had, I had to cut it and weld it to make it very resistant. At one end, I welded two flat bars to hold the forks, and at the other two more to hold the crankshaft. Since the crankshaft already had bearings, I made a bearing holder by disassembling two larger bearings, and with the outer ring and some nuts, I managed to make a very resistant anchor. I made a hole in the end of the forks to attach the two pistons or forks to the connecting rod. I used a threaded rod that I had previously tempered to make it harder. This is done by heating it until it is red hot and then cooling it very quickly. This process, called tempering, increases hardness. At the junction between the rod and the connecting rod, I used a bronze bushing to reduce friction. I wanted to use a bearing, but when I went to check the price of a bearing of this size, they gave me astronomical figures. Now we had everything practically connected. We could see that the pistons, when they came out, made the crankshaft turn perfectly. Now came the hardest part, making a valve that lets the steam in at just the right moment. Remember that this is a simple engine, so the valve would only have to fulfill a particular function, which is to let the steam in when the engine is at its bottom, dead center, that is, when the rod is fully contracted. My first idea was to manufacture one using a truck connecting rod and the valve guide in the following way. I put the valve in the bench drill, and using the grinder, I started to wear it down as if it were a low-budget lathe leaving a fairly thin part in the center and a little more at the ends, two thin grooves. In these thin grooves, I connected a rubber ring, which is literally a small rubber ring that serves as a seal to prevent the steam from escaping. Then in the valve guide, I drilled a hole in the center and welded two nuts to it. So this valve that we made would work in the following way. As you can see, the steam would enter through one of the nuts, one of the sides that is completely covered by the valve. But when the valve moves, we see that it opens and allows the steam to pass directly to the other side. At one end, I made a thread, and with a metal rod, I extended the valve. The idea was that at the end of the crankshaft, I would place a cam that would touch with the valve at the right time. This would open, let the steam pass, and that's it. Everything sounded pretty good in my head, but when I tried it, it didn't work. The system I had made, despite having a rubber ring, was leaking air everywhere, and the pressure was very low. At this point, I decided to use a little trick, although, well, I don't really know how much of a trick it was. I decided to replace the mechanical valve we had made with an electric valve like this one. This valve is basically the same. It serves the same function, but this one is operated by energy by electricity. When voltage is applied, it allows the gas to pass through. I say I don't know how much trickery I did, because solenoid valves like this one were invented in the early 1800s, while the steam engine was invented in the late 1700s. I also had to work on the exhaust system. Originally, the exhaust is in the same valve, but since it was now electric, I needed to think of something else, and here I tried several things. First, I tried to put two electric valves, an intake and an exhaust one, but synchronizing them was almost impossible and it worked really badly. Then I based myself on a steam engine plan and made the exhaust simply by making two holes in the piston from the bottom. But the holes were too big and the performance was still bad. In the end, I made two small holes at the top 
and it seems that now it was going well. Now with the electric valve in place, I needed a system that activates it at the right time. I started by leaving the cam on the crankshaft and putting a switch that every time it turns, it activates it. But the mechanical fatigue that the switch received made it damage quickly. In the end, I put another switch but on the side so that the same piston hits it when it returns. And this made it much more efficient. And now, yes, it was time to finally put its flywheel on. The inertia disc in steam engines works differently than in other engines. The disc must be large and heavy compared to the engine. In my case, I used an old cast iron pulley that weighs around 5 kilos. I wanted to put a larger one but couldn't find any. As it was quite deteriorated, I first removed all the rust with a very simple technique. I filled a container with water, vinegar, and salt until the water turned cloudy. I submerged the wheel and performed electrolysis using a 12V source. You don't need a source like mine. You can use any 12-volt transformer, for example, from modems or some cheap one, and you should connect the negative cable to the rusty piece and the positive cable to another piece of metal that you want to sacrifice. This is because the rust from the wheel in this case is going to stick to that metal you put in and you leave it overnight and it comes out great. I then brushed it to make it look better, painted the center red, and gave the rest a coat of clear acrylic to prevent it from rusting again. Since the wheel didn't fit, I had to print an adapter. I did it using Grillon's Green Plastic, which is the brand I always use for everything as it gives me great quality. By the way, in the description, I'm going to leave a link with all the 3D pieces I designed for this engine, in case you might want to do it too. And to screw the wheel, I extended the crankshaft by welding a threaded rod to it. And now, I could put the nut to fix it. In addition to that, I printed two more pieces. One to hold the switch that activates the solenoid, and the other to hold the pistons on the front side. One thing I didn't mention, and is important, is that steam engines must be hand-oiled since, unlike common engines, they don't have a self-oiling system in their moving parts. What we can do is a self-oiling system for the internal components like the pistons, but I'm going to incorporate that in Phase 3. I wanted it to look as nice as possible, so I tried to be in all the details. For example, I ran the switch cable inside a copper pipe that I bent not only does it look much better, but it looks genuine from a steam engine. But this is a steam engine and I'm using it only with air as I still don't have the boiler. I wanted to test it with steam using this pressure cleaner, but the pressure it generated was so little that it didn't even move the engine. In the next phase, we will make the boiler a component as essential as the engine. I'm going to make it with a storage tank system, copper coils, a coal burning chamber, and even a venting and combustion acceleration system. Because I want it to look great, I got this old bronze heater to use as a facade and make the boiler inside. Um, it's going to turn out great. Finally, I connected six bar compressed air to the engine and tested it. It spun excellently, picking up incredible speed. The crankshaft caused some movement, likely due to imbalance, but it's not a major concern for now. Let's go.